Carlos looked at the girl standing before him and said nothing. Debbie approached him and whispered in his ear, Hey, are you stupid or something? His face soured almost immediately at what she said. He cast a warning glance at her and said in a cold voice, Are you sure you want to offend me? Debbie immediately shook her head and replied with a flattering smile. You asked me to buy my classmates ice cream, but the money was yours. Technically, it was you who bought them the ice cream. Why would you do that? You were late for class, he said indifferently. What did it have to do with? Before she could utter the words, buying them the ice cream, she shut her mouth. In truth, she didn't understand his motives. What was he trying to say? That there was nothing wrong with me eating ice cream, but I shouldn't have been late for school? Was he trying to imply that? Actually, I didn't run eight kilometers, nor was I the one who paid for the ice cream. So basically, I never received any punishment. Seriously? Is he really such a nice guy? She thought to herself, while eyeing Carlos from head to toe in disbelief. She was not accustomed to being treated well by Carlos. When she noticed Carlos Ramrod's straight posture, she asked curiously, Have you served in the army before? Ah. Uh -huh. Then why did you quit the army? You prefer being a CEO. She could imagine he must have been the most handsome soldier in the army. Debbie believed that if he were wearing the military uniform right now, she would literally be drooling over him. What a pity, she sighed. As if Carlos understood what she was thinking about, he flashed a naughty smile at her and whispered in her ear, If you really want to learn more about me, why don't you come and see me this evening? We can have an in-death exchange. What? In-death exchange? If he had only mentioned in-death exchange, she would not have been lost in various conjectures. Why did he stress this evening? Was he implying something else? Men would never tire of telling dirty jokes. And Carlos was no exception. When Debbie realized what he was implying... She flushed scarlet with shyness. She coughed once and cleared her throat. No, thank you. Bye. She answered simply before turning to leave. The man said something behind her back that made her stagger. She steadied herself and turned around to say something. But the man was not there anymore. He had already left to instruct the students in training. Did I mishear him? No, that can't be right. She thought to herself. From that day onwards, Debbie had changed her motto from Don't run with the crowd and go your own way to I need to sleep with Carlos Hua. I must sleep with him one day. A haven for bookworms and dreamers. Initially, Debbie had planned to sleep in the dorm after school was dismissed. However, on her way to the dorm, she received Philip's call. Debbie, Mr. Hua just called me. He just got off work and is on his way home. He asked me to remind you that you will have an English class with him this evening. Debbie went pale as blood drained from her face. What have I done to anger Carlos Hua? Why does he always have to mess with me? She cried in her mind. When Debbie arrived at the villa, Carlos was not back home yet. She went up the stairs to her room and threw herself onto the bed. After a few minutes... She called her friend Jared. E. Jared. Have you found me a suitable job? Since the door to her bedroom was unlocked, the man standing outside was able to eavesdrop on their conversation. He was about to knock on the door, but withdrew his hand in the last minute. On the other hand, Jared had just arrived at a bar with his buddies. When he saw the caller ID, he found a quieter place and answered the phone. I thought you were kidding. Are you seriously looking for a part-time job? He asked in stunned disbelief. Of course I'm serious. I've been living on a shoestring lately. You need to help me out, buddy. She thought that her money was enough to keep her going for the next two months. But unfortunately, Carlos had made her buy her classmates ice cream. As a result, she was going to run out of money in just two days. You have no money? Jared asked, confused. But as he was about to go further, his buddies waved at him, urging him to get in with them. 
he had to reluctantly dismiss Debbie by saying, All right, I'll get back to you on this tomorrow. Oh, okay. Uh, could you? Debbie was too shy to continue because she had never been caught up in such an awkward situation before. It was very unlike her to behave like that because she had always been a straightforward person. Jared asked curiously, Tomboy, are you okay? Don't mince words. Just say it. This isn't like you at all. Debbie rolled her eyes, cleared her throat, and finally said, Uh, I was wondering if you could lend me some money, like a few thousand dollars? I'll pay you back once I have my salary. Debbie was so embarrassed she wished she could dig a hole in the ground and stick her head in. She shouldn't have asked Carlos for a divorce while she was still a college student. If she had waited until she had graduated and found a job, things would have been totally different. Pathetic didn't even begin to explain how she felt right now. Not only did she have to look for a job, but she had to ask Jared to lend her some money. Unfortunately, she didn't have the means to turn back time. Jared was completely shocked. Debbie has no money? That can't be true. As his buddies kept on urging him to get in the bar with them, he had to bid farewell to Debbie. Okay, I'll transfer the money later, he said before he hung up. Within one minute, Debbie received a text message from the bank which said five zero 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 dollars had been transferred into her account. Immediately, she sent Jared a WeChat message. Got the five zero zero zero. Thanks, bro. She clicked the send button and flashed a relieved smile. All of a sudden, someone knocked on her bedroom door. Realizing who it was, she put her phone in her pocket and jumped out of the bed. She trotted towards the door and opened it to greet Carlos. Old man, good evening. From the looks of it, he had just arrived home as he was still wearing his white shirt and tie, with his coat hanging from his arm. Carlos eyed her from head to toe and said in a calm voice, Grab your English book. I'll be waiting for you in the study. After saying that, he turned around and walked towards the study himself. When Debbie entered the study with her English book, Carlos was standing before the French window, smoking. He stood straight as a ramrod. He had a picture-perfect profile. The first two buttons of his shirt were unbuttoned, exposing a part of his firm, chiseled chest. Debbie felt somewhat thirsty at the sight of the handsome man smoking before the window. She swallowed hard and wished for this peaceful moment to last a bit longer. Carlos saw her come in through the reflection in the window. He walked towards the desk and killed the cigarette but in the ashtray. Sit, he demanded briefly. Looking around the study, Debbie believed that the couch would be the most comfortable place, so she went towards the couch and made herself comfortable. Carlos followed and sat next to her. They were so close, she could feel the warmth of his body. In a low, tantalizing voice, he asked, How's your English? I'll need to assess that before we can continue. We are going to communicate in English this evening. Debbie was slightly taken aback. Communicate in English? Seriously? I've never passed any English tests before. I can only speak a bit of English. I had learnt it before I had to travel abroad. First of all, you need to pay. Carlos opened his mouth and English words poured out of his mouth like a waterfall. Debbie didn't know what he was talking about, but she could tell that his accent was of that so-called received pronunciation. The only words she was accustomed to were words like, first of all, and you need to. She had no idea what he was trying to tell her. When Carlos finally stopped talking, Debbie sat up straight, cleared her throat and answered, Good night, H. How much? The more she said, the deeper he frowned. After she finally finished speaking, he gripped the book more tightly. He tried his best to calm himself down and not make her feel intimidated and discouraged. Debbie winked at Carlos gloatingly, without the slightest awareness of his gloom, while he stared at her with a poker face. I'll teach you from now on, he said in English. Despite being clueless of what he said, 
Debbie nodded after a transient daze. Carlos thought she understood that sentence, so he continued, Next, follow me. Debbie hesitated a little, and then she nodded again. Carlos tapped his index finger on the book and said, Are you a fool? Fool? Sounds familiar, but I've forgotten what it means. This time, without hesitation, she simply nodded, because she found that so far nodding had not brought her any trouble yet. Therefore, she assumed that no matter what he said, nodding would be the proper response. Carlos sighed and closed his eyes hopelessly. He took out his phone and typed, Are you a fool? on a translation app and showed her the translation. Debbie stared at the screen with surprise. She realized that she had nodded at him back then. Calling me a fool? He is a fool, an old fool at 28. Ashamed and infuriated, Debbie pushed the book away and stood up from the couch before she declared, I quit. You're making fun of me. When she was about to leave, Carlos grabbed her hand and pulled her back onto the sofa. However, the force of his pull was so strong she fell off the sofa. Ah, uh, she cried out before her body hit the floor. Without a conscious thought, she desperately grabbed his shirt. Carlos quickly wrapped his arm around her waist and pulled her into his arms. Annoyed, Debbie raised her head and glared at him with fury. The next thing she knew, apart from the meeting of their eyes, his lips had somehow found their way to hers. She didn't realize they were so close. Embarrassed, Debbie's blush seared through her cheeks and for a minute she thought her face was on fire. Although the little episode surprised Carlos as well, it only sent him into a three-second trance. Before she knew it, he quickly made their accidental kiss official. Debbie intended to turn him down, but when she recalled what he had said to her on the playground, an idea popped up into her head. She mustered up the strength and pushed him onto the couch. Lying there, Carlos looked at her in disbelief. What just happened? Did I, Carlos Hua, just get knocked over by a girl? Debbie then walked towards the couch and leaned over him with her hands on his chest. Instantly, Carlos understood what she was trying to do. However, he was not going to give her a chance to succeed in what she was up to. He grabbed her by the wrist and said, calmly sit up. Let's continue our lesson. Debbie's eyes widened with shock. She felt hurt. How is he able to stay calm in such a situation? Apart from my pretty face, am I not attractive enough? That must be it or else. Why would he not be tempted? Did he say that to me on the playground because he doesn't have any feelings for me? Debbie's heart grew numb. Her mood turned sour like bad milk. For the first time in her life, she hated herself. During the remainder of the lesson, she kept silent. Carlos was focused and she seemed attentive. But only she knew what was going on in her mind. Elevating stories, elevating minds. An hour later, Carlos closed his book. That's all for today, he said. With a nod, Debbie put away her book, looking distracted. After the lesson, she got up to leave the study, but as soon as she opened the door, Carlos asked her to come back. She turned around in puzzlement. He took out his wallet from his pocket, pulled out two cards, and handed them to her. Here you are. One is a savings card with nine-figure savings in it, and the other is a credit card with no limit. The savings card had the annual revenue of one of the branches of his companies. He figured it would be enough to cover her expenses. Debbie's eyes almost popped out at his words, and her mouth gaped open. Nine figures? She held out her hands and counted on her fingers. One zero, two zeros, three zeros, hundred, thousand, million. My God, one hundred million? No, thank you. Debbie refused him, instinctively. She had her reasons, all of which were valid. Carlos knew what she was thinking. Although he wasn't sure what her life would be like in the future or what kind of person she would turn out to be right now, she was a person with a good heart, pure and honorable. She still didn't understand how important money was yet. We're not divorced yet. You're still my wife. I see no reason why I shouldn't support my wife. For two minutes, Debbie couldn't find her voice. No, Mr. Hua, we're getting a divorce. I don't want to owe you anything. I'm 21 years old. I can support myself. In truth, after everything that had happened between her and Carlos in the past few days, 
There were moments when she had wavered from getting a divorce. But still she felt they should divorce each other if they could. Debbie looked resolute when she said that. He could tell from her eyes that she had meant every single word. However, he was used to taking control over everything. This time wouldn't be an exception. You can't wait to get rid of me, huh? With that, he put the cards in her hands. He didn't say it, but his behavior told her that he wouldn't accept her refusal. Yes, Mr. Hua, I don't know what you want from this marriage, but I won't change my mind. Debbie might be stubborn and arrogant, but in front of her was a man much more stubborn and arrogant than her. Carlos frowned. Boss, sir, Mr. Handsome, Mr. Hua, she has addressed me in so many ways. When is she going to call me honey? I won't change my mind either. If you don't use these cards, should I remind you of the consequences of defying me? Sure enough, as soon as he finished talking, Debbie flared up. Do you always get what you want by threatening people? Do you have no other ways of convincing people? Debbie snapped at him. Her voice hardened with rage. Other ways? I do have other ways, for example, sleeping with you and making you incapable of getting out of bed for three days, he said. You? You? You are shameless. I won't give you a chance. Then I won't give you a chance to get a divorce, Carlos responded casually. Debbie wanted to make a snappy comeback, but she failed. After a while, she said, I'm going to bed. She couldn't bear to spend another second in the same room as him. When she got to the door of her bedroom, Carlos spoke again. Give your classmates money back back now. Stop looking for a job. You won't have the time for a part-time job and university. Were you eavesdropping on my private conversation? Debbie got even angrier. How could he? This is unacceptable. Debbie wanted to wrap her hands around his throat and strangle him, but she knew better than to pick a fight she wouldn't win. Eavesdrop? I was just passing by your door, which, by the way, you left open, when I overhead you talking to someone on the phone. Ah! Debbie screamed inwardly. She wanted to punch him hard so he wouldn't even recognize himself in the mirror. Breathing in and out, she tried to calm herself down. Finally, she managed to form a smile on her face. Mr. Hua, how about I give you ten grand and we get a divorce? The man fall into a silence. However, Debbie realized that ten grand was too little for a rich man like Carlos. It was so little he probably wouldn't bother picking it up if he had dropped that amount on the floor. One million, she declared. The man remained silent. Ten million, Debbie declared, gritting her teeth. Again, there was no response from the man. Fifty, fifty million. As long as she could get rid of the bane of her life, she was willing to give him fifty million. It was not like she had that kind of money right now. Suffice it to say, she would have to work extremely hard to earn that amount, but Debbie firmly believed that she would have it eventually. Fearing that the girl would have a mental breakdown in anger and anxiety if he kept silent any longer, he finally said, Why don't we talk about this when you actually have 50 million? For a man like Carlos Hua, 50 million was just the same as 50 bucks. For Debbie, on the other hand, it was another story. Fine. Carlos, you win. Debbie's seething resentment finally reached boiling point as she stormed out of the study. In a dramatic display of anger, she slammed the door shut behind her. Back to her bedroom, Debbie threw all her casual clothes out of the closet and crammed them in a corner of the room. Standing with arms akimbo, she stared at the empty closet, but that was not enough to vent her fiery rage. Go shopping with me. I'll buy clothes, cosmetics, jewelry, everything, she told Casey on the phone. Experience the magic of words. He wants me to spend money? No problem. Making money might be difficult, but spending money is easy. Earlier on the playground, he said that if I slept with him, he would set me free. Okay, then just wait and see Carlos Hua. I'll sleep with you. Early the next morning, Debbie went to university in the pink lace dress that she had worn on her 21st birthday. 
The thought of the look on Carlo's face when he'd seen her in that dress that morning made her want to burst out laughing. At the dining table, Carlos put on a cold face as per usual, but the amazement was plain in his eyes. Debbie whirled in front of him on purpose and asked, Mr. Handsome, how do I look? Did he forget that I am a girl? Even pretending to be a man won't be hard for me, not to mention acting like a lady. Do I even need to pretend to be a lady? I used to be a sophisticated girl when I was little. How hard can it be to act like a sophisticated lady? With the help of foundation primer, BB cushion, brown eyebrow powder, black eyeliner, and Giorgio Armani Lip Maestro 400 The Red, the tomboy had transformed into a princess. Once she used to wear her hair in a ponytail or a bun, but now she let it flow elegantly as a princess should. Her long, black hair, so smooth and silky, as if it were tailored from a starless night sky. As she whirled, her hair tumbled down to her waist, stirring in the wind. The last time at the cruiser party, Debbie had captivated Carlo's heart with an elegant evening dress. However, the simple pink lace dress she was wearing now seemed to have made her even prettier. Carlos lowered his eyes and concealed all his feelings for her. Eat your breakfast, he said flatly. Only he knew how crazy he was feeling about her deep down in his heart. He wished he could just throw her onto the table and, even though Carlos had tried to hide his emotions, Debbie was quite satisfied with his minimal reaction. She wasn't expecting him to compliment her anyway, so she ate her breakfast quietly without uttering another word. Debbie's eyes brightened as her mind replayed the pleasant memories from the morning. When she smiled, all the boys stopped moving and gathered around her spellbound by her beauty. I would give up everything for that smile. They all thought, having noticed all the attention she was getting, Debbie winked at the boys. Some returned goofy grins at her, while others blushed, and the rest bumped into each other, flustered, as they walked by. My, my goodness, Tom. I mean, Debbie, are you going on a blind date? Christina changed the way she usually addressed Debbie, because at that moment, Debbie didn't look like a tomboy at all. The last time Debbie had worn that dress, she hadn't put on any makeup, nor had she paid any special attention to her hairstyle. Needless to say, unlike today, she hadn't turned as many heads on that day. When Debbie, along with Jared, had gone to that anniversary party on that cruiser the other day, the only difference from her usual daily image was that red evening dress. As a result, none of Debbie's friends had ever seen her so stunning. Dixon, who was standing next to Christina, remarked, Debbie, I guess you are not here to study but to distract the boys. At that moment, Debbie was actually feeling a bit tired of pretending to be a different person. The smile on her face had finally gone on strike. Most importantly, Carlos wasn't at the university to see her anyway. As soon as the stiff smile was gone, Debbie walked over to Christina, hugged her, and complained, Christina, I never knew being a woman could be so exhausting. Huh? How come? I feel good to be a woman, Christina replied. Having considered the fact that she and Christina were two completely different kinds of women, Debbie waved her hand resignedly and suggested, the class will begin soon. Let's go to the classroom. When they entered the classroom, all eyes were drawn towards Debbie. Jared ran to her, wrapped his arm around her shoulders and declared, Debbie, I am going to pursue you. I mean it. She rolled her eyes at him and replied bluntly, I'm sorry, Jared, but I didn't put on this outfit for you. Then who is it for? Are you in love or something? Jared had a keen ear. What? Debbie is in love? Who is the lucky man? Debbie, come on. Tell us. Casey asked anxiously while shaking Debbie's arm. Her voice was thick with shock, as if someone had just told her that the sun had risen in the middle of the night. Even a charming man like Carlos who can't pique Debbie's interest. Who is this mystery man that has won her heart? He must be perfect. Casey wondered. Don't be ridiculous. I'm not in love. I'm just upset. 
Debbie explained to her friends. She couldn't stop thinking about what had happened the night before. However, her friend's curiosity was not even close to being satisfied. They wanted to ask some more questions, but the professor had stepped into the classroom. They had to put aside their curiosity for the moment. In the afternoon, Carlos' class began as scheduled. Sitting in the middle of the multimedia classroom, Debbie seemed awfully quiet. As if that weren't strange enough, she had attended the class on time and she didn't even stop the boys from coming into the classroom. Although she seemed well-behaved, Carlos didn't believe that she had somehow changed in less than a day. Later, her actions proved that he was right about her. In class, whenever Carlos laid eyes on her, she'd wink at him. What confused Carlos was that before, other women had winked at him constantly, but he had never felt a thing, be it supermodels, actresses, or socialite divas. But when this girl winked at him, he'd lose focus and fail to concentrate. When the bell rang, some girls rushed to the podium and surrounded Carlos immediately with excitement in their eyes, as if they had finally met their Prince Charming, even though that was not Carlos' first lesson with them. Debbie strode to the podium, patted on the shoulder of one of the girls, and gestured for her to move away. When the girls saw it was her, the joy on their faces evaporated. Debbie could sense their anger in the air and in their eyes. However, none of the girls dared to speak up. She stopped by Carlo's side and watched him out his things away with one hand propped against her chin. All the while, Carlos pretended not to notice that she was there. Mr. Hua, there are some points in this lesson that I don't understand. With everything tidied up, Carlos cast her a cold look and made his way to the door without saying a word. Seeing Debbie slighted, some students started snickering. Some even taunted. Embarrassed, Debbie held her head up high and commented, Why is he so arrogant? As if I wanted to learn all this stupid stuff. Unfortunately, Carlos hadn't walked out of the classroom just yet. He heard every word she had said. A smile appeared on his lips. Humiliated and angry, Debbie walked back to her seat, took out her phone, and sent Carlos a message. Carlos Hua, don't come back to the villa tonight. I don't want to see you. Debbie waited, but Carlos didn't reply to her message even after her next class had begun. Meanwhile, an emperor sped in the direction of Ziel Group along the road. The man in the back seat read the message he had received repeatedly, and his heart began to sing with joy. Tristan, who was in the passenger seat, opened Carlos' schedule and started his report. Mr. Hua, you are going to Singapore tomorrow for a couple of days. An accident has occurred in one of the factories there, and the problem still hasn't been resolved yet. In the evening, Debbie lay in bed and paid full attention to every single noise that came in from outside the window. However, it was past midnight already, and she still didn't hear the sound of Carlos' car. Is he angry at me? Did he really decide not to come home? Did I cross the line? After all, this is his house and I kicked him out of it. With such thoughts running in her mind, Debbie felt troubled and restless. Then she sent him another message to see how he would react. Mr. Hua, she simply typed on her phone. To her surprise, Carlos responded almost immediately with a single word reply, Yes. Unfortunately, she didn't know what to say next as she stared blankly at her phone screen. Debbie hesitated for a long moment. Where are you? She finally asked. Office. Carlos had just arrived at the branch company in Singapore and was set to work. However, Debbie didn't know that he had gone abroad. She thought that he was still in Y City and had decided not to come back because of her message. Well, about today in the classroom, I... It was not my fault. You ignored me in front of everyone. Perhaps you should come back. It's okay. I can just avoid you in the villa. She gibbered nervously. She felt like she owed him an apology, but she was too embarrassed to go through with it. Carlos guessed how conflicted she was at that moment as he read her message. 
She is so cute, he thought to himself. Since he couldn't go back right now, Carlos replied, Go to sleep. Having noticed how short his replies were, Debbie assumed that he was angry with her. After I made the effort of contacting him, still, he doesn't want to come back. How can he be so petty? She covered her head with the blanket in frustration. Fine, suit yourself. I have apologized anyway. Soon after, she drifted into deep sleep. But the next two days were unsettling for Debbie, because she hadn't seen Carlos even once, neither at the university nor at the villa. For some reason, all his classes were postponed until further notice. Confused and worried, Debbie finally asked Philip about Carlos' whereabouts. When she had finally learned the truth, she was relieved but also furious. Debbie realized that he had already reached Singapore when he had gotten her messages the other night, and he had deliberately decided not to tell her the truth. I've been beating myself over this for two days, you self-centered son of a bitch. Two days ago, she had planned to go shopping with Casey and Christina, but then something had come up and they had to get a rain check on their plans. Now that she knew Carlos didn't disappear because of her, she felt like been shopping and soon, the three girls went to Shining International Plaza. Debbie bought clothes and cosmetics to her heart's content. Every time she spent Carlos' money, she felt as if she were kicking him in the sheen. She felt fantastic. After Debbie had paid for the cosmetics, Casey whispered, Tomboy, you've been acting weird lately. You are wearing makeup, you've been buying cosmetics, and you are buying clothes that you would have never worn before. This isn't you. Are you really in love? Debbie cast a short glance at the fashionable clothes in the bags and shook her head earnestly. Believe me, I'm not in love. It's just that my self-esteem was hurt, so now I'm trying to fix it. Challenged and then rejected by a man, she started to suspect that she wasn't charming enough for him. Okay, since everybody is free tonight, why don't we hang out together? Casey suggested. Besides, the next day was Saturday. No school. After arranging to meet at East City Villa, they left for the supermarket to buy some food and drinks. When they got to the elevator, Debbie spotted a man and a woman in an ad on the LED screen. In the ad, Olga, delicately made up and in a cream dress, was intimately standing by a man wearing a dark blue suit. With their arms interlocked, she was smiling at the camera happily. Mr. Hua and Miss Me, you two make a perfect couple, the host said. Olga didn't say anything but smiled at the host. Clever move. In this case, silence was the best response. Casey shook Debbie's arm and pointed at the screen excitedly. Isn't that Mr. Hua? And the woman next to him is... Wait, why is that Olga with him again? Are they getting married or something? She really isn't good enough for Mr. Hua. Mr. Hua is not only handsome but also well-read. Olga would be lucky to be with a man like him, Christina sighed. The ad and her friend's comments made Debbie's insides boil up with anger. She stared at the man in the ad angrily and cursed him in her heart. There he is, a married man, fooling around with another woman. Bah! What a pig! Casey caught her resentful glare. Debbie, don't hate Mr. Hua so much. Even though you two seem to be fated to be enemies, at least you are lucky enough to have met a man like him. We, however, weren't blessed with the same kind of opportunities. Debbie kept her lips pursed. When they got everything from the supermarket, they headed for the villa. Tonight would only be about Debbie and her best friends. Jared, Dixon, Christina, and Casey had been to the villa a couple of times before Carlos had moved back, so they were familiar with the place. After Debbie had sent Julie home early, the boys and girls were left alone to eat, drink, and be merry. They had a lot of fun. At 10 p.m., after having gulped down tens of can of beer, they were all quite tipsy. The living room was a mess. Empty cans and boxes, used tissues, and fruit peel covered the floor, looking like a carpet of garbage. 
Debbie and Casey were singing a soppy love song. Christina and Dixon crouched on the sofa, whispering and laughing amongst themselves while Jared was alone. Suddenly, he lifted his leg and gave Dixon a kick. Hey, careful with your cute back and forth in front of me. Man, I'm all alone here. Otherwise, I'll have to steal your girlfriend one day. Unlock the magic of reading with Sigma Nu Epsilon Viotiveta. Dixon kicked him back and yelled, I've been single for more than 20 years. If you dare steal my girlfriend, I'll hunt you down and end you. Jared felt goosebumps all over his body. The two boys' conversation has Christina giggling away. Debbie was too drunk to steady herself. After the song, she got up to sit on the sofa when she accidentally fell into Jared's arms. Debbie accused Jared of tripping her and the latter complained that she was putting on weight. While they were exchanging pinches and kicks, the door of the villa was opened from outside. In the eyes of the man at the door, it looked like they were flirting with each other. When they saw the man's face, Debbie's friends exclaimed, Ah, Mr. Hua! They all sprang off the sofa in fright. Only Debbie remained where she was. She brushed her hair and stared at the door still in trance. No, it can't be him, she murmured. She had inquired Philip about Carlos' itinerary. He wasn't supposed to be back until two more days. I must be very drunk, Debbie thought. The man was dressed in a black suit and vest, with his jacket hanging from one arm. His eyes swept around the room and caught sight of the mess in the living room. Tristan, who was standing behind Carlos, looked at the woman who was staggering to her feet. His eyes widened in astonishment. Mr. Hua has rushed back from Singapore and this is what he sees? Mrs. Hua is going to be in a lot of trouble. Tristan prayed for the students in his heart. Intimidated by Carlos, they were already half sober when they saw him standing at the door. One by one, they took turns and greeted him politely. Good evening, Mr. Hua, said Jared. This is creepy. What's Mr. Hua doing in Debbie's home? He wondered. Nice to see you, Mr. Hua. Dixon and Christina chimed in. Dixon had sensed that Carlos and Debbie had a personal relationship when he had seen Carlos in the dean's office. But he had kept that knowledge to himself all along. Mr. Hua. Casey couldn't believe her eyes. Who am I? Where am I? Why am I seeing Carlos Hua in Debbie's house? Then the same question popped up in Debbie's friends' heads. Why is Carlos Hua here? Mr. Handsome. A crisp voice caught the attention of everyone in the room. What? Did Debbie just call Carlos Hua Mr. Handsome? The living room grew deafeningly silent, while the air was too thick to breathe. Jared's legs were shaking like dry leaves. He felt as if his bladder was about to let go. Even his father didn't scare him as much as Carlos did. Who would believe the man at the door was only six years older than him? Discover your next adventure at Sigma Nu Epsilon Viotiata. Jared shook his head in disbelief. Nothing else mattered anymore. The most important question in their minds was, what is Carlos Hua doing in Debbie's house? By this time, Debbie's head was a lot clearer. Carlos glanced at her with a straight face and then walked inside. The rest were scared stiff. They could feel their hair stand on end. Everyone held their breaths. Before Carlos said anything, they all lined up against the wall. Jared kept his head low, like a horrified turtle. Have you been drinking? Carlos asked. The line of people nodded in unison, like a flock of birds bobbing their heads. Debbie clutched the corner of her clothes. All she kept thinking was why Carlos had come back unannounced, all of a sudden. How was she supposed to explain their relationship to her friends? After glancing again at the cans on the floor, Carlos asked, Did all of you drink this? Some of the kids nodded while the others shook their heads. Debbie was one of the latter. She wasn't dumb enough to admit in front of Carlos that she had drunk a lot. Tristan, go buy ten crates of beer. 
None of them is allowed to leave until they finish all of them. The man ordered sternly. The students gasped and looked at each other in horror. Debbie, however, was doing math in her head. To match his status, Carlos would only buy imported beer. Generally, there were 12 bottles in a crate. Therefore, they would have to drink 120 bottles of beer in total. Divided by five, that left them with 24 bottles of beer each. No normal human being could drink 24 bottles of beer. As if that weren't bad enough, each of them had already drunk 10 cans of beer before Carlos walked in. When Debbie came to that conclusion in her mind, the smile on her face froze. She couldn't even bring herself to utter a single word to beg for the tyrant's mercy. Tristan followed his boss orders and turned around. When he was about to leave, Carlos added, These kids are having a nice get-together. It's a pleasant occasion. The beer must be of good quality. Be sure to buy canned Amazon beers. Yes, Mr. Hua. Tristan wished the kids luck under his breath. After he closed the door behind him, Casey's face turned ashen and Jared collapsed onto the sofa. The other three didn't understand why they had reacted like that. Actually, it was because Casey and Jared knew that instead of 12, there were 24 cans in a crate of Amazon beer. Therefore, they would have to drink 240 cans of beer in total. Each of them would have to drink 48 cans of beer. No, I can't let him treat us like this. Debbie felt it was time for her to step forward. She couldn't watch as her friends got dragged down like that. She took one step forward and said, Carlos Hua, I invited my friends over and I take full responsibility for the party. If you want to punish somebody, punish me. Let my friends go. Christina was about to help Debbie when Casey grabbed her hand while shaking her head. How can Christina not see that Debbie and Carlos have a special relationship? Debbie is our best chance to get off the hook. Carlos sat down in the armchair and slowly lit a cigarette while Debbie was waiting for his response. However, Carlos remained silent. Having run out of patience, Debbie said, Since you aren't saying anything, I take it that you have given us your acquiescence. No problem, just as long as you drink all ten crates of beer yourself he said casually as his fingers slid on the screen of his phone. When he found Tristan's phone number, he typed, Go home, Mr. Hua, sir. Debbie is a girl. Certainly she can't drink all the beer by herself. Let me drink with her, Jared put in. When he heard that Debbie had taken all the responsibilities, his legs were not shaking anymore and he jumped off the sofa instantly. Whatever relationship Debbie and Carlos had, Casey didn't think it mattered anymore. Mr. Hua, they will die if you make them drink all that beer. Then Dixon broke in. I am also to blame for the party. I should be punished with them. Me too, said Christina. Carlos' eyes shifted from one to another. Very touching. Your friendship is deeper than I thought. Debbie had heard that before, but when Carlos said it, she couldn't help shivering. Of course, we're old friends, she said defiantly. If you don't want to drink the beer, okay then, he announced. The kids felt a huge relief when they heard that. But unfortunately, Carlos wasn't finished yet. But you'll have to agree to study abroad next year, he said to Debbie. Carlos had been in management for nearly 10 years, but he had mostly been managing subordinates. This girl, his wife, however, was a totally different ball game altogether. Lately, she had been attending all her classes and hadn't been in a single fight. However, every time he thought of her weak English, it pained him. And now, the mess in the living room and not to mention the alcohol abuse, all this had given him a new kind of headache. However, he still didn't want a divorce. He thought maybe she would be more focused if she studied overseas, where she was away from her friends. Back at home, when Jared went upstairs, his legs were weak as jello. As soon as he saw his father, Jasper Hahn, he embraced him immediately, close to tears. Dad, 
I swear I won't drink a drop of alcohol in the next month. When his son hugged him, Jasper had intended to ask his son to leave him alone. But what Jared said intrigued him. What's happened? He asked his son. Dad, do you know Mr. Hua? Jared asked. Mr. Hua? Which Mr. Hua? Carlos Hua. Yes. Upon hearing Carlos' name, Jared immediately let of of his father and stood straight. With a towering height of six foot eleven, he looked like a tree. Jasper Han looked as his son in confusion and asked, Why did you suddenly bring him up? Because he is... He is a demon. I feel sorry for you old guys who have to do business with him. When Jasper Han heard his son call him an old guy, he slapped him in the shoulder and said, You ungrateful lad. I'm your father. Show some respect. Did Carlos who give you a hard time? I'm telling you, stay away from him. Messing with him is the stupidest thing anyone can do. He will make sure you will never see the sun rise again. Despite being frightened, Jared sneered to save face. When his phone buzzed, he read his WeChat message and his eyes widened like watermelons. What the hell? If nothing had happened tonight, he wouldn't have believed what was written in the message. However, after all of that, he was ready to believe that even fishes could fly. In the group's chat on WeChat, Debbie said, Carlos Hua is actually my husband. Then she added, But I'm trying to get a divorce. Moron, commented Jared. He was relieved when Casey and Christina pretty much said the same thing. Who in their right mind would not want to be Carlos Hua's wife? In East City Villa, Debbie was told to clean the living room by herself as punishment. She replied to her friend's messages as she put the empty cans into the bin. You don't understand. We didn't get married because we loved each other. It's nothing like that. I don't love him and he doesn't love me. I'm still young. Why should I be trapped in this loveless marriage? Casey had jumped out of bed when she read Debbie's first message. Her hands were shaking from excitement. It took a while before she calmed down and said, Debbie, are you really that old-fashioned? Times have changed. Who cares about love now? Can love keep you alive? Although you don't love each other, Carlos is rich, handsome, and powerful. That's everybody's dream. What else do you want? When Debbie sat down on the sofa speechlessly, Christina said, I just realized that I have been shopping at the Shining International Plaza with the owner of Shining International Plaza. Dixon couldn't believe Debbie was married and what shocked him even more was that her husband was Carlos Hua, the man whose face was as cold as an iceberg. Think it over, Debbie. Divorce is huge. To be honest, I think Mr. Hua is the right man for you. You know, considering your personality. He might be the only one that can take your hot temper down a notch. Dixon's words made Debbie even more determined to get divorced. She didn't want a husband who would take control of her life. After a long while, Jared joined in the conversation again. Debbie Nien, you would be a muttonhead to file a divorce. Debbie couldn't stand to read her friend's messages anymore. She threw her phone away on the sofa in distress. Why didn't any of them support her in her decision? However, her phone didn't stop buzzing. She knew that her friends were still trying to talk her out of the divorce. Go to sleep. Since Carlos Hua has been holding back the divorce, what I think or want doesn't really matter. Instantly, the chat became quiet. Her phone stopped beeping because no one was talking. Debbie shook her head in disappointment. These were her best friends, but none of them was on her side in this matter. Not only should I end my marriage, I think it's time I find myself some new friends, she thought bitterly. Before going to sleep, she sent another message in the group's chat. This is confidential. Don't tell anyone else. At almost half past midnight, after playing some video games, Jared saw Debbie's message and he joked, I have sold your secret to a journalist. By tomorrow morning, everybody will come to know that you are Mrs. Hua. The beeping of the phone woke Casey up. She looked at the screen drowsily and snapped, 
Don't disturb my sleep. Back off. Finally, everything went silent. The next morning, when Debbie was getting dressed, the newly bought fashionable clothes in her closet upset her. She regretted buying them. Why had she bought all those clothes just to look good for Carlos? Why couldn't she continue to live her life the way she wanted to and just be herself? She fumbled in the closet for the old casual clothes she had crammed in the back. They had been wrinkled, but she put them on anyway. After putting on a pair of white tennis shoes, she went downstairs. Ah, this is so much better. By then, Carlos had already finished his breakfast. Something on the iPad caught his interest. Try to wake up half an hour earlier from now on, he said when he saw her. Why? As soon as she sat down at the table, Julie handed her a bowl of kanji with salted pork and century egg. She took a sip and looked up at Carlos. Because then you won't stay up so late. Here came the intrusion once again. Debbie was fuming. Why do you care whether I stay up late or not? You fool around with other women and you don't see me passing judgment on you. Discover your next adventure at Sigma Nu Epsilon Viodiata. Carlos suddenly lifted his head from the iPad and stared at her coldly. Debbie started to get nervous. What? Am I wrong? Are you jealous? Carlos never treated any of those women seriously. If him being with another woman bothered her, he wouldn't mind making some changes to suit her preference. His question blindsided Debbie. I, I, of course I'm not jealous. Why would you think that? Do as you like. I don't care. The last few words were not only directed to Carlos, but also to herself. Carlos' eyes returned to the iPad without another word. For some reason, Debbie couldn't enjoy the delicious bowl of kanji with salted pork and century egg in front of her, even though that was her favorite dish. Instead of wolfing it down, she remarked, If you want to marry one of them, just let me know. I'll be glad to make room for her. Carlos slowly put down the iPad and walked over to her. He gently grabbed her wrist and pulled her into his arms. At that moment, Julie was busy in the kitchen. Debbie flushed and tried to free herself. Julie, Julie will see us. Regardless, Carlos explained slowly, I don't want to marry any of those women. I only see them for work. None of them matters to me. Do you understand? Yes, I do. Did he have to be so close to her to say that? She didn't want to think what he would do if she had said she didn't understand him. The man nodded in satisfaction. There's a bit of rice on the corner of your mouth, he said. Huh? The sudden change of subject confused her a little. When she understood what he meant, she stuck her tongue out to lick the rice. Before she knew it, Carlos wrapped his arms around her waist and pressed his lips against hers. After breakfast, Debbie dashed out of the villa on her scooter, totally ignoring Carlos, who was behind her, also on his way to work. Her cheeks were still burning with embarrassment until she stopped at the traffic lights one kilometer away from the villa. That man sure knew how to make a woman's heart flutter. Bang! A dull sound startled her and brought her back to reality. The sound came from an empty juice bottle that had been thrown out of a Lamborghini before it rolled on the road and finally stopped at the side of Debbie's scooter. Debbie took a short glacé at the red light. There were still 30 seconds to go. She got off the scooter, picked up the bottle, and tapped on the window of the Lamborghini. The window was slowly rolled down and revealed a woman wearing sunglasses in the passenger's seat. Judging from her outfit and appearance, Debbie assumed that she was most likely a parvenu. The woman's clothes were fancy, but the color was gaudy. Her unbound curly hair had been dyed blonde and she was wearing hoops. The man in the driver's seat was in his thirties. When they heard Debbie tapping on the window, both he and the woman turned to look at her with a confused look on their faces. Without a word, Debbie took several steps back, threw the empty bottle in the air and kicked it into the limo. Somehow it hit the woman in the head, but Debbie couldn't care less. 
Hey, maybe your parents never taught you anything when you grew up. But just so you know, you deserve this. And if you keep being such a disgusting piece of shit, more people will be glad to teach you a valuable lesson. When Debbie finished talking, there were only three seconds left before the red lights turned green. Allowing the people in the car no time to respond, she returned to her scooter and sped off. Meanwhile, Debbie's friends were waiting for her at the entrance of the university. When her scooter appeared, they all walked up and surrounded her. Casey gave her a pat on the helmet and said, Yo, as the powerful Mrs. Hua, don't you think it's bad for your image to drive around on a cheap scooter? Debbie took off the helmet and rolled her eyes at her. You helped me pick this scooter. Don't forget that you liked it too. That's because I didn't know your real identify. Otherwise, I would have convinced you to buy a Ferrari, a Lotus, a Lamborghini, a Rolls Royce, or a Maserati. Anything but a scooter. Casey protested. After some hesitation, Jared asked, Debbie, don't forget that our high school classmates gathering is this evening. Can you make it? Dixon added cautiously. We agreed to go to the party a while ago, but I know your husband won't allow you to drink, and we won't force you to drink either. Will he still allow you to come? Debbie rolled her eyes and snapped. Guys, if you keep acting like this, you won't be my friends anymore. Okay, okay. Let's not talk about it. Let's go to the classroom. It is your husband's class. Christina winked at Debbie. She had tons of questions for Debbie, but the entrance of the university was too public for a private conversation. She decided to put off talking with Debbie until later when they were alone. Debbie wasn't sure whether to laugh or to cry. She wanted to tell Christina not to address Carlos as her husband, as their marriage was only real on the outside. However, Christina wasn't aware of that, and it was a long story. Debbie was in no mood of revisiting at that time. Before anything else, she decided to shut her mouth and park her motorbike first. Christina and Dixon went to the multimedia classroom first. Finally, Debbie, Casey, and Jared entered the classroom, which was almost fully occupied. Fortunately, Christina had saved them three seats. While the three of them were walking towards their seats, two girls were arguing with Dixon. Why did you take up our seats? Casey went and sat in the seat next to Christina. Jared sat next to Casey. And Debbie sat beside Jared. The other side of Debbie was the passage. Debbie put her books on the desk in front of her and leaned against the back of her seat as she looked at the two girls who were still arguing. You say these are your seats, but do you have any proof? If you have a problem, why don't you fight us for these seats? Finders keepers, losers weepers, she said. Debbie Nien, we were here first, but then we went to the ladies' room. When we came back, Dixon had already taken our seats. You can't be this unreasonable, Gail, one of the two girls, argued. She regretted not leaving her books on the seats before going to the ladies' room. After hearing what Gail had said, Debbie flashed a mocking smile and snorted, Come on, jail moo! Why do you use the ladies' room as an excuse every time? You must really like it, huh? Why don't you just live in the ladies' room? The last time in the shopping mall, Gail had used the same excuse to mess with Debbie. Her lame excuse really amused her cousin. Although Gail was livid, she didn't dare snap back at Debbie. She knew she was no match for her so she had to look for somewhere else to sit with her companion. Moments after the bell rang, the man most of the students were waiting to see stepped into the, the classroom. As usual, he swept his eyes over the crowd, and when he spotted the girl he was looking for playing with her pen, he felt satisfied and began lecturing. The content of this class was scientific economics. All the students were listening carefully, including Debbie. All of a sudden, her phone beeped. She stole a glance at the man on the platform to confirm that he was not looking in her direction and took out her phone secretly. When she read the text message on her phone, she froze on the spot for a long time. Eventually, she decided to reply to the text. 
After sending her reply, she put her phone back and stared blankly at her book. All she was thinking about was the text. Deb, I'm flying back the day after tomorrow. Will you pick me up at the airport? I've missed you so much. I want to see you the moment I get off the plane. Would she go to the airport to pick him up? Of course, she would not. She sent a reply to his text saying that she couldn't pick him up at the airport as she had classes to attend on the day he was coming back. Debbie received a reply almost instantly. I'll be in Y City at 3 p.m. I can help you make up for the missed lessons. You still haven't forgotten about me, right? While all her attention was focused on that text, Debbie failed to notice that her husband was approaching. When she was typing the words, I ha, she was interrupted by a loud knocking sound. Knock, knock, knock. Carlos knocked on the desk in front of her and reached out his hand towards her. Holy crap! She cursed inwardly. Carlos had told them before that it was forbidden to play with mobile phone in his class. Debbie immediately put her phone back in her pocket, sat up straight and gave him a wide smile. Carlos, however, had no intention of letting her go. He pointed to her pocket, gesturing for her to hand her phone over. Debbie had forgotten to lock her screen before she put her phone away in a hurry. If she gave Carlos the phone right now, nothing would stop him from reading the conversation between her and another boy. Embarrassed, she smiled at Carlos and put her hand on his palm as if she didn't understand that he was asking for her phone. The others in the classroom widened their eyes in disbelief. How dare Debbie put her hand on Mr. Hu's hand? All the girls stared at Debbie angrily. How they wished they could chop her hand off. With no change in facial expression, Carlos gently shook her hand away and reached out his hand again. This time, the fact that Debbie placed her other hand on his hand and looked at him with her doe eyes angered the students even more. A girl cursed through her gritted teeth. Wow! Shame on her! Debbie looked in the direction the voice came from and cast a warning glance at the girl. Startled, the girl looked away and set her sights elsewhere. Elevating stories, elevating minds. All of a sudden, Jared, who was sitting next to Debbie, took out her phone from her pocket and gave it to Carlos. Mr. Hua, Debbie has been paying attention to you all this time. Debbie's jaw fell to the floor. Oh my God, I'm done. Jared Han, what did you do? She cursed him in her mind. When Carlos took over the phone, the screen was still on. As a result, he saw the conversation between his wife and another boy. Within seconds, his entire face darkened. He cast a cold glance at the girl before him as he put the phone in his pocket and walked back to the platform to continue lecturing. I might get buried alive today. She cried inwardly and cast a burning glance at Jared. Confused, Jared whispered in her ear, You've got some nerve. Even I don't dare to play with my phone in his class. I tried to warn you when he was approaching, but he was staring at the both of us and so I didn't dare to make a move. Never mind. He's your husband. You'll have your phone back after the class. Why are you being so worried? Why was she being so worried? Her husband saw the conversation between her and her ex. More importantly, she had been planning to type, I had a thing for you once, but it's over between the two of us. Sadly, she has just managed to type, I ha. Before she was interrupted, Carlos must have misunderstood. I ha. For, I have a thing for you. Damn it. Under the desk, Debbie gripped Jared's fingers as tightly as she could. Although Jared was in extreme pain, he didn't dare utter a single cry. The pain appeared on his face in the form of slight twitches. While Carlos was not looking at her, she took the chance and whispered in Jared's ear, If Carlos is going to punish me for this, I'll tell him that I was sending the text message to you. What text message? Suddenly, Jared had a bad feeling in his gut. Debbie gave him a wicked smile and said, Hayden Goo's coming back. He said he missed me. 
He wants to see me. Hayden Goo is coming back? Why? Jared was too slow to realize Debbie's true intentions. Debbie peeked at the man on the platform, only to realize that he had been staring at her all time, with icy, cold eyes. I don't know why, but it has nothing to do with me, she replied in soft yet cold voice. When Carlos looked away, she added, I didn't save his number, so if Carlos asks me about it, I'll tell him that it was you. Damn it! Jared looked at Debbie in stunned disbelief. Are you serious? Please don't do this to me. I didn't know you were exchanging message with Hayden Goo. Amused by Jared's reaction, Debbie winked at him and teased. So now you've realized that you made a big mistake, huh? Can you imagine what Carlos would do to you if he thought you were having an affair with me? I'm really curious to find out. All of a sudden, Carlos turned around and glared at Debbie. Immediately, she sat up straight and looked forward at the screen. His cold eyes made her feel like she was lying on a bed of nails. Oh my God, why is he looking at me like that? His gaze is sharp enough to see right through my soul, she thought. It was not until then that she realized Carlos came to teach in the university for her. He made sure that Debbie had to attend all of his classes and he was even strict enough to give her trouble if she tried to cut classes. Just as she had expected, Debbie was asked to go to Carlos' office when the class came to an end. She gave Jared her books and told him, Go buy some firecrackers when you have time. Firecrackers? What for? Jared was confused. When Carlos quits teaching, I'll set off firecrackers to celebrate the glorious moment. Jared stood there without a word, unable to comprehend what Debbie was trying to accomplish. In truth, he felt pity for Carlos, because he was the one who'd have to spend the rest of his life with a bad girl like Debbie. In Carlos' office, Carlos walked in and placed Debbie's phone on the desk, the screen of which was now locked. Unlock your phone, he demanded coldly. An idea popped up in her head just as Debbie reached out her hand to grab her phone. However, he quickly grabbed her hand and threatened, If you don't unlock it, I'll unlock you this evening. Unlock me? What does he mean by that? It must be one of his dirty jokes again. Feeling embarrassed, Debbie forced a fake smile and said, All right, Sigma Nu Epsilon Viodiata, a haven for bookworms and dreamers. In the blink of an eye, just as Carlos released her hand, she grabbed her phone and dashed towards the door. A cold voice from behind pulled her to a halt. Look at your phone first. Then you may decide whether you want to run away or not. What? Look at my phone. Without further delay, Debbie unlocked her phone and looked over the messages between her and Hayden. Much to her surprise, Somehow the conversation had continued even after her phone had been confiscated by Carlos. The last message she had read from Hayden said, I'll be in Y City at 3 p.m. I can help you make up for the missed lessons. You still haven't forgotten about me, right? Unfortunately, Carlos had taken her phone away before she could send a reply. However, now she was looking at a reply on her phone screen that said, my husband can help me make up for missed lessons. To which Hayden had replied, Deb, you must be kidding me, right? Are you still mad at me? To be honest, no ordinary man would have the audacity to date a girl like you. Debbie was spitting fire when she saw this. She took a deep breath and continued reading. The last message sent from her phone was, My husband is not an ordinary man. Hayden hadn't replied to that message. Perhaps he believed that she had married some other man. Carlos wrote these messages himself? When did he do it? How did I not see him? When she looked at the time logs of the messages, Debbie was surprised to find that Carlos had sent the messages while he was still lecturing to them in class. Debbie remained calm. In fact, she was surprised by her own ability to stay calm in such a moment. If it were in the past, she would have already broken his bones. But the truth was, she was no match for him in martial arts. 
After she read the messages, she didn't turn around to face him. Carlos lit up a cigarette, took a moderately big drag, and exhaled. Your lover, Carlos sneered. My lover? What the fuck? However, Debbie decided it would be best to spare him the details. She turned around and looked at her husband. Yes, he is. So, will you divorce me now? Leaning his back against the seat and resuming his usual cold expression, Carlos remained silent for a long while before he asked, Do you love him that much? Debbie had once told him about a boy she had feelings for not too long ago. Her words came back to him and he believed that boy to be the one who had sent her the messages. Debbie shook her head unconsciously, but then she thought of an opportunity and nodded. Yes, I love him very much. However, she wasn't telling the truth. The truth was that she had loved the boy very much, but that was a very long time ago. After falling out with his family members, she no longer wanted to ingratiate herself with them. Now all that remained between the two of them was a fleeting memory of their brief encounter. The reason why she lied to Carlos was that she hoped it would convince him to divorce her. However, Carlos' reply was something she could not have anticipated in a million years. Good. You know, I like challenges. He curled his lips and continued, I'm sure to drive him out of your heart. Words had left Debbie as she stared into Carlos' eyes in utter disbelief. Having run out of patience to argue, she turned around and walked out of the office. When she shut the door behind her, Tristan walked over to her with an unervingly wide grin on his face. Mr. Hua asked me to tell you that he had bought two movie tickets and he would like you to go to the cinema with him this evening. Debbie looked at the name of the movie on Tristan's phone screen. It was a horror film set to start at 2 a.m. Shivers ran down her spine almost instantly. Without any hesitation, she turned around, opened the door and ran back into the office. I won't send him any messages from now on, Debbie promised. Carlos flashed a satisfied smile as he stood up and walked towards her. Wait for me at home this evening, he said as he reached out and held Debbie in his loving arms. Debbie put her hands on his firm chest and was just about to say something when he lowered his head and kissed her on the lips. Her eyes widened and then shut close as she melted in his arms like a doll made out of wax. Why does he always kiss me in his office? He is a good kisser, though, she mused. In a private booth of the Orchid Private Club, a handsome man was leaning against the couch with a glass of red wine in his hand. The man was none other than Carlos. Sitting across him were two men wearing expensive branded clothes, Wesley and Damon Hahn. They were Carlos' closest friends. Wesley was not interested in what the other two were talking about, so he went out to play golf. Damon Hahn was shocked and dazed by what Carlos had to say about his wife. It wasn't until Carlos kicked him in the leg that he came back to his senses. A girl who is seven years younger than you? Don't rob the cradle, Carlos. She is too young for you. I've never heard you mention any women before. This was the first time we've ever talked about women. And you're telling me that she is seven years younger than you? And she's so willful and unruly. Are you sure you want me to teach you how to court her? Carlos cast a freezing glance at his old friend and said, Cut the crap! Fine! Damon Hahn, the infamous playboy, had lots of experience with women, and perhaps that was why Carlos sought his advice. He sat straight and said to Carlos in a serious tone, Women love money, and you happen to have lots of it. Why don't you just use your money? Carlos had supported Debbie for three years. But now she had been asking for a divorce instead of asking for money. Furthermore, she even wanted to pay back all the money that she owned him in the past three years. Last time, when Debbie ran out of money, she asked her friend for help instead of going to her rich husband. Even after Carlos had given her his band card, she refused him without hesitation. Only when he threatened her did she agree to take his card. That was just the kind of person Debbie was. 
Suffice it to say, money wouldn't work for Carlos. She doesn't want my money. He answered in a cold voice. Damon Hahn shook his head in disbelief. He never thought such a girl could exist a girl who could refuse Carlos Hua and his boundless wealth. Win her over with your body. You are a handsome man with a great body, Damon Hahn suggested. The number of women who wanted to marry Carlos could fill the whole Pacific Ocean. Despite his unwillingness, Carlos decided to tell the truth. She has no interest in me. The truth was, Carlos had tried to seduce her with his handsome face and strong body before. But to his disappointment, she had turned him down. The fact that she didn't have any feelings for him was a hard pill to swallow. But he had come to terms with the truth. Damon Han chalked and almost spit out the wine in his mouth. With a mischievous gleam in his eyes, he said, I'm starting to like her. Let me give it a try. She's my wife. Carlos cast him a murderous glance. What? She's from the Nien family? Damon Han thought to himself, The girl is from the Nien family? Jared's good friend is also from the Nien family. Could they be the same person? What did Jared say her name is? Is your wife Debbie Nien? Da Mon Han probiert. Carlos looked at him and nodded. What a coincidence. Your wife is my brother's best friend. Ha ha ha. I can imagine how you feel now. Damon Han and Jared shared the same father but had different mothers. Perhaps being a womanizer and being good with women ran in the family. Carlos rubbed his arching brow and swore to himself that he would never divorce Debbie, however hard she was to handle. Yes, I admit that she's a willful girl, but luckily she doesn't smoke. Nor does she hang out with dubious people. Carlos paused for a moment and then added, Apart from your brother, Jared, is my brother a dubious fellow in your eyes? Damon thought to himself. He couldn't help grinning at Carlos' description of Jared. You're right. He's not very reliable, commented Damon. Jared, as a rich second generation, had some disreputable associates. And Damon believed it was quite normal. Wesley, who had finished playing golf, went back to rejoin his friends. He sat down in his seat and said indifferently, Megan's 18th birthday is coming next month. Where are we going to celebrate her birthday? Five years ago, Wesley and Carlos had adopted Megan Lawn. She was an innocent and adorable girl, whom Damon and Curtis had grown quite fond of. Since it's Megan's coming-of-age ceremony, we need to make it a grand one. Why don't we celebrate it on her favorite island? We can drink, sing, and dance all night long, said Damon. After some consideration, Carlos offered... She loves the island in Q City. I'll buy the island for her as a gift and you guys will be in charge of the other affairs. Damon made a face and exclaimed, Wow! Look at you, Mr. President. The island at least costs hundreds of millions of dollars. You made it sound like you are going to buy groceries at some convenience store. If I were a woman, I would do everything I could to make you mine. After all, owning Carlos who means owning the world. Carlos cast a chilly glance at Damon and mocked, If you were a woman, you would look but ugly. No man would fall for you. Damon, who had always been proud of his handsome face, was enraged by Carlos' mean words. Carlos Hua, you're just jealous of me and my looks. I'm such a handsome man. If I were a woman, I would be the most beautiful woman in the world. Am I right, Wesley? Ignoring Damon's shallow expression, Wesley refilled his and Carlos' glasses. He clinked glasses with Carlos and said, I'm on a vacation now and I have plenty of time to spare for the party. Don't worry. I'll take care of everything. If I need your help, I'll call Emmett. Carlos shook the glass in his hand and said briefly, Call Tristan. Is there something wrong with Emmett? I thought he was your personal assistant. Why should I call Tristan instead? Wesley asked in confusion. In his eyes, Emmett was the one who had always been standing beside Carlos. After a long pause,
Carlos finally decided to tell them the truth. Emmett, he and my wife deceived me together. His words set Damon roaring with laughter. Even Wesley couldn't help laughing. They cheated on you? He probed. Carlos snorted. Maybe she had the audacity to cheat on me. But Emmett? Come on. He wouldn't dare. Damon and Wesley felt sorry for their friend. Debbie is so dauntless. She isn't afraid of doing whatever she wants. But I strongly believe that someday she'll be tamed by me. Carlos thought to himself. Damon inquired. So, what did you do to Emmett? He's currently working on a construction site. He needs to understand how hard life is for workers. With that, he'll cherish his job as my personal assistant more. An unsettling smile flashed across Carlos' face. He heard that Emmett had been doing well on the construction site. Damon and Wesley were rendered speechless. After a while, Damon broke the silence. Why did Curtis have to be away on a business trip today? If he were here, we could play mahjong together and order some beautiful women. Now we need a fourth player, and you don't want to play mahjong with other people. I'm so bored I want to kill myself. Disregarding Damon's whining, Carlos raised his wrist to check the time. Debbie's yoga class is supposed to end soon. I need to go home to teach her English. He finished off his red wine with one gulp and stood up from his seat. Gentlemen, I shall be leaving now. Please enjoy yourselves. Are you serious? Damon looked at Carlos' retreating figure in stunned disbelief. He wondered if all men changed colors after getting married. But he married the girl three years ago, and I've never seen him go back home this early in the past three years. Does that mean he fell in love with her just recently? Damon wondered. The doors of the private booth were pushed open by two bodyguards, and noises came from outside the room. Just as Carlos was about to get out of the room, Damon's voice came from behind his back. Carlos, since you don't have any means to make her fall in love with you, I'll give you a piece of advice. Why don't you be nice to her as much as you can? I guess your best hope is to move her with your sincerity. Damon knew Jared well. If Jared believed that Debbie was a good girl, Damon wouldn't doubt that. What does a good girl want? She doesn't want money or fame. I guess she only wants a man who would love her truly. Damon thought to himself. Without turning around or responding, Carlos left the booth. Damon raised one of his eyebrows and then turned around to look at Wesley. Want to bet? Not interested. Wesley turned him down without any hesitation. After all, he was not that close to Damon, at least not as close as Carlos was. Wesley himself was a military officer, while Damon was a gang member. If it weren't for the sake of Carlos and Curtis, Wesley would have sent Damon to jail a long time ago. Don't be such a killjoy. Listen, I bet Carlos will become a slave for his wife sooner or later, and he will be willing to kneel down before her. If Damon knew that Wesley had always wanted to send him to jail, he would feel wronged. Yes, it was true that he was a gang member, but he had never crossed the threshold into terrible and unacceptable behavior. Wesley didn't know what to say to him. However, he firmly believed that a proud man like Carlos would never kneel before a woman. Damon has been long drooling over one of Wesley's pistols, so he said, if I win, you will give me that pistol of yours. Damon has heard rumors of Wesley's new double-action, semi-automatic pistol. With its stainless steel and polymer construction, it was one of the lightest pistols in the world that packed quite a punch despite its weight and size. Okay, if I win, you need to leave the gang. Damon remained silent for a while. After a lot of contemplation, he was almost certain that he would be the winner. He nodded and raised his glass. They gulped their wine, put the glasses on the table and left the booth to catch up with Carlos. Debbie's high school classmates gathering happened to be on the same day. Jared had made a reservation at the Orchid Private Club in advance. Debbie arrived on the phone with her yoga teacher asking for a leave. 
All the while Jared showed her the way as she was completely unaware of the club she was in. When the call ended, she was already in a private booth. It was the largest booth in the club. There were four big tables in the room and many guests had already arrived. When people saw Jared, they all stood up to greet him. It was the first time that they had been to such a luxurious club together. The club was for members only, and the annual fee alone cost millions. Therefore, they couldn't help but fawn on Jared. Jared was obviously in a good mood. Tugging at his sleeve, Debbie asked him in a low voice, Why did you book a room here? Are you sure you can afford it? Don't worry. I have my brother's VIP card. There is at least 10 million in it. So, enjoy the night and help yourself with everything here. Debbie knew that Jared had an older brother named Damon, but her impression of him wasn't exactly positive. Although, she had met him once or twice in passing, she had long forgotten what he looked like in person. Where adventures await between lines, Jared was itching to spend all the money in Damon's VIP card. In truth, apart from being half-brothers and sharing the same father, they didn't have a lot in common. One day, Jared stole the VIP card from his brother's table when he was passing by Damon's room. Debbie had heard about Damon from when Jared used to complain about him to her. From what she could gather, Damon was always very nice to his younger brother, whereas Jared would treat Damon with disdain. Although it was Jared's one-sided statement, Debbie could tell that he had been obedient to his older brother on some occasions. Jared, what are you two talking about? Come over here. One of their classmates urged the two to join them. Jared responded in a loud voice, All right, all right. Scott, you won't be allowed to leave here until you have more alcohol than blood running through your body. All of a sudden, Jared looked at Debbie with a concerned expression on his face. Tomboy, I won't drink much tonight. You don't need to drink if you don't want to. This caught Scott's interest as he looked at Jared and cheerfully shouted, Hey bro, what's up? Are you two dating or something? Do you have to ask for Debbie's permission before you drink? Huh. Debbie and Jared were very popular in their high school. Most of their classmates used to joke about their relationship. However, the truth was quite far from reality. Although they had been good friends who trusted each other, that was all their relationship was, a reliable friendship. Apart from that, they had absolutely no chemistry between them. Debbie was interested in guys who weren't afraid of commitments, while she thought Jared was more of a playboy. On the contrary, Jared thought Debbie was a tomboy, whereas he liked winsome coquettes. They both understood each other very well and agreed that they could only make good friends. What? A couple? Come on. Even if we spent the night in the same bed, nothing would happen between us besides the usual chatting and fighting. Jared held the chair out for Debbie like a gentleman, but the latter cast a reproachful glance at him before sitting down. In truth, Debbie never enjoyed taking part in these gatherings. Most of the girls chose to isolate her because she was a pretty girl and the boys liked hanging out with her. Their impression of Debbie was that of a bitch who was just pretending to be a tomboy to attract boys. The girls began to speak ill of her amongst themselves in soft murmurs so that Debbie wouldn't hear them. But she could tell from their body language and the way they looked at her that they were quietly conferring about her. Why didn't they just say what they had to say to Debbie's face? Mostly because they were afraid of being beaten up by her. Besides, they didn't want to offend Jared. Why didn't they just keep to themselves? They would if they could. But they were so envious of Debbie that they needed some way to vent their anger on her. Debbie, however, felt wronged and misunderstood. After all, she had never laid her hands on a girl before. Even when her cousin, Gail, had given her multiple reasons to hurt her, Debbie refrained from laying even a finger on her. Instead, she would let Gail off with just a warning. It wasn't like Debbie was afraid of the girls. Far from it, the girls wouldn't even stand a chance in a fistfight with her. 
She could easily injure them without even breaking a sweat. A few moments later, Jared went to the men's room to clear out the several bottles of beer he had drunk. Right after he left, the girls started to taunt Debbie because they believed that her arrogance and power only lasted as long as Jared was with her. Where stories blossom, even after so many years, she's still running around after Jared like one of his lackeys. I guess he's not interested in her at all. Hey, have you guys heard that she confessed her feelings for Mr. Hua at his launching ceremony? She said, Carlos Hua, I love you at least ten times. Of course I've heard of it. By the way, a friend of mine told me that she is a lesbian. What? I feel sick. Debbie was appalled at the unconscionable comments being made about her, and she instantly regretted coming to the party. She found it amazing how these people hadn't changed at all even after so many years. They might have grown, but they were hardly qualified to be considered grown-ups. They passed derogatory remarks about her nonstop, and after a while even some of the boys joined in the banter. Debbie was just about to get up and leave when another boy sitting at a nearby table stood up before her. He shouted contemptuously, Are you here to enjoy the party or make mindless gossips? Why don't you look in the mirror to see what kind of people you are first before you talk about someone else? Until then, shut the hell up. The boy was red in the face, as burning rage hissed through his body like venom. Debbie's mouth gaped wide open as she looked at him in surprise. This was the first time someone else, apart from her own friends, had come forward to defend her. But who was this unfamiliar boy who stood up for her? If her memory hadn't failed her, his name was Gregory Song. Perhaps it was because Gregory was not some rich second generation, so the others didn't take his words seriously at all. They were a little startled at first, but soon they began to mock him as well. Gregory, do you have a thing for that tomboy? A girl taunted. Debbie's friends called her tomboy as a nickname. But when this girl addressed her as tomboy, the sarcasm in her voice was quite evident. She wanted to remind people that Debbie didn't have anything womanly about her apart from her pretty face. Much to Debbie's surprise, Gregory didn't deny it. He snapped back ragingly. So what? I'd rather date a girl like Debbie instead of a nosy Parker like you. I'm so touched. Another girl mocked. I want to throw up. Makes me wonder what he'll get out of this. Why is he overreacting like this? Gregory, you'd better be careful around her. Otherwise, she might beat you black and blue. Words had left Debbie. And although she had taken several deep breaths to calm herself down, there was a fire burning inside of her that she couldn't extinguish. Fortunately, she was well aware of her anger management issues. If they weren't her high school classmates, she would have made them beg for mercy. How's the food? Debbie grinned at the girls sitting across the table. Not knowing why she had asked such an irrelevant question, one of the girls nodded and answered, the food here tastes as good as the one on the fifth floor of Aliath building in Shining International Plaza. Really? It's such a pity that you won't be able to enjoy it much longer. With a demeaning smile, Debbie stood up from her chair and slammed her fist on the table. Bang! The wine glass in front of her fell to the floor and shattered into tiny pieces. Silence befall the private booth. What Debbie did next sent the girls screaming hysterically. Since the dinning table was fixed firmly to the floor, she turned around, lifted her chair, and smashed it on the table. The delicious dishes that had been on the table just a few seconds ago were now littered on the floor, while shards of glass and porcelain flew in the air. Debbie Nien, are you crazy? This is Orchid Private Club. Do you think you can afford the compensation? Everyone stood and backed up a few steps. They were starting to feel intimidated by Debbie. Debbie rolled her eyes, took a step back and kicked Jared's chair to the table beside her with full strength. The girls sitting at the table who were mocking Debbie shut their mouths immediately. Some boys who had a good relationship with Debbie realized what she was going to do and came to stop her. 
She shook their hands off and spoke in a cold voice. If you try to stop me, we won't be friends anymore. She promised herself that she would give these blabbermouths a good lesson today, so that they would not dare to provoke her ever again. Debbie, these dishes are expensive. A boy reminded her kindly. Actually, Debbie's classmate didn't know whether she was from a rich family or not. As far as they could tell, she rode a BMW to school every day. But she didn't wear designer clothes, nor did she spend money left, right, and center. I will tear this place apart without caring how much money it would cost me. Carlos who has enough money, and he wants me to spend his money. Why not use his money to compensate for the damages? She thought to herself. Debbie grabbed a wine bottle from the table and smashed it in front of several girls. They were so frightened that they fell onto the floor. The waitresses who were serving the customers in the private booth were so stunned they forgot to call security. They had never seen anyone create such a ruckus in this club before. Debbie found the girl who had been passing lewd comments about her and Gregory and pinned her up against the wall. If you dare cook up such a story again, I'll cut your tongue out and feed it to you myself. Debbie threatened. The girl's face was as pale as a ghost. Too shaken up to utter a word, she shook her head, implying that she would not do it again. Finally, Jared came back into the room with one of his drinking buddies. They were completely shocked by what they had seen. The room was a mess. Jared scanned the room and found Debbie with her hands wrapped around some girl's throat. Tomboy, what's going on here? Everyone in the room heaved a deep sigh of relief when they heard Jared's voice. They all gathered around him and complained. Jared, please do something. Look at Debbie. She's gone mad. She has ruined everything. Some of the yellow-bellied cowards had already sloped off, as they didn't want to be dragged into this. After someone caught Jared up on what had been going on, his next action took everyone by surprise. Jared jumped onto a chair and pointed at the girls huddled in the corner while shouting at them. You bitches! Are you out of your damn minds? Are you really that stupid to cook up stories like that? You thought we wouldn't hurt you because you're girls. Huh? Tomboy, you can do whatever you like to them. I'll handle what comes after. Jared was 210 centimeters in height, and when he was standing on the chair, he looked like a giant that nobody wanted to mess with. By then, things had already gotten way out of hand. One of the waitresses finally came to her senses and was just about to call security when Jared stopped her. No one is allowed to leave this room. Debbie took a deep breath as she let go of the girl and walked towards Jared. She tugged at his sleeve and consoled him. Easy, Jared. I'm done. I won't take part in this type of gathering again. Jared jumped off the chair, shook off Debbie's hand and walked up to the girls. He picked up a plate from the floor and threw it towards one of the girls, covering her pink dress with brown sauce. Paying no heed to the girl's petulant whining, Jared said, Do you really think that Debbie has no idea of the horrendous things you say about her behind her back? Then, he picked up a pig's foot and stuffed it in another girl's sweater, which immediately turned brown because of the sauce. You dumb bitches should feel lucky that you are girls. Otherwise, I would have beaten you blind with my own hands. He added, The girls were about to cry. They hadn't expected Jared to be so cruel to them. However, amidst all the chaos, only one boy seemed unaffected by what was going on. While all hell broke loose, he sat still in his seat, casually eating the dishes. Debbie recognized his face with one glance and felt surprised. Is that Gus Lou Curtis' younger brother? How come I am just noticing him now? Debbie wondered. She quickly dismissed her curiosity and decided to get out of the private booth. Debbie grabbed Jared's arm and bolted out of the room, without delay. They rushed so fast they accidentally bumped into two people outside. One of them was a woman in high heels, who staggered and fell onto the floor rather quickly. Ouch! My leg! Are you blind? She cried out. 
Startled, Debbie bent over immediately to help her. I'm really sorry, Mississippi. I didn't do it on purpose. She apologized in a conciliatory tone. With the help of the woman's companion, Debbie helped the woman to her feet. It was not until then that she recognized who the woman was. Yang, this must be Mercury retrograde. What lousy luck. Debbie cursed inwardly. First, she had a massive fight with her high school classmates. Now, she ran into a rude couple she had encountered this morning. It was the couple inside the Lamborghini, who had thrown an empty bottle out of the car window. The man recognized Debbie as well. His face contorted with venomous outburst and he raised his hand to slap her. Bitch! Debbie reacted very promptly. She grabbed his hand and knocked him down onto the floor in one fell swoop. The man lay on the floor, groaning in pain. Discover your next adventure at Sigmanu Epsilon Viodiata. The girls who had followed Debbie and Jared out of the booth saw this and trembled with fear. Debbie knows martial arts. She just knocked a man of 200 kilograms down on the floor effortlessly. I'm glad she didn't hit us, they thought. The woman then realized who Debbie was. Ignoring her companion, she raised her bag to whack Debbie in the head. It's you. I've been looking for you to teach you a lesson. You are so screwed now. Before her bag could touch Debbie, Jared snatched it away from her hand and threw it onto the floor. The woman then looked at her companion and knelt down beside him. Oscar, are you okay? Help me up. I will make that bitch pay. He cursed. All people, including Debbie's classmates and even the waitresses of the club, were shocked by what was going on. The hallway was overflowing with people. Some concerned. Some angered, but mostly just confused. At the same time, when Damon left his private booth, he received a message that said his VIP card had been used. This club belonged to his close friend, Carlos. Although Carlos had given him the card, he had never used it before, as he never had to pay for anything in this club. More than $300, 000 has been deducted from this account. That's really strange, he thought. He was about to go to the cashier's desk to check what had happened, when he noticed the waitress running towards another hallway. Curious as cats, they were so eager to watch the fun that they failed to notice Damon. What's going on? Why is there so much noise? Damon asked a manager behind him. The manager had been entertaining the three distinguished guests all the while, so he didn't know what had happened either. He shook his head and shrugged his shoulders in confusion. Meanwhile, Debbie wasn't able to leave yet because of the angry couple. She was starting to get impatient because she was running late for her English class with Carlos at 8 p.m. Debbie was about to knock the man down again. But Jared stopped her. He whispered in her ear, Tomboy, the, this man is the infamous Oscar. He's a notorious gang leader who has already gone to prison countless times over the innumerable crimes he has committed. Since your husband isn't here to protect you, do not offend him. Debbie became even more frustrated. She couldn't just call Carlos and tell him that she had been in a fight with a gang leader. What would he think of her? Will Carlos go up against a gang leader for me? I don't think so. After some hesitation, Jared offered, How about I call Damon? He's a gang member as well. Maybe he can remedy the situation. Before Debbie could reply, a man's voice shot through from behind the crowd. What is going on here? Everyone turned their heads to follow the voice. Wow, is that Mr. Hua? The crowd murmured amongst themselves. I didn't expect to see Mr. Hua here. And he's with Mr. Lee and Mr. Han. They are so handsome. Debbie, however, stood there motionlessly, as if paralyzed from the neck up. The mere mentioning of his name sent a cold shiver down her spine. Why is he here? I was just about to go back home now so that I could attend his class at 8 p. M. How embarrassing. Debbie's face was stuck in an incredulous expression. A waitress walked up to the manager and explained, Mr. Shwe, 
These two people made trouble here and smashed a private booth. Then they started a fight with Oscar and his woman. The manager cast a casual glance at Debbie. Since he didn't know who she was, he assumed she was just a nobody. He said coldly, Ask her to pay the compensation twice over and beg Oscar's forgives. 